uh, and said, well, show us a rental agreement. And that's where uh, we learned that the bomb truck was rented by a person representing himself to be Robert D. Kling. Murder. The unlawful killing of another living, breathing human being. Or, as was the case on April 19, 1995, on a cool, crisp spring morning in downtown Oklahoma City, 168 living, breathing human beings. On this season of A Murderous Design, we'll study what may be the largest circumstantial evidence trial ever heard in an American courtroom, the United States of America versus Timothy James McVeigh. Based on the authentic trial transcripts and interviews with those who tried the case, we will uncover the author responsible for the formation and execution of A Murderous Design. I'm Brandon Birmingham. This is Timothy James McVeigh versus the USA. There's going to be evidence of this crime in Junction City. Um, and so they started uh, uh, working their way through the hotels in the area and came across the Dreamland Hotel, which is about a mile or so distant from Elliot's body shop. The problem with the witnesses from the government standpoint is they all claim to have seen one other person with Tim McVeigh. With that description of Robert Kling in hand, Junction City became a new host to federal agents doing a good old-fashioned neighborhood canvas. They fanned out across town asking whether anyone saw a man fitting that description driving a rider truck. Eric McGowan was 19 years old, living on the edge of Junction City with his mother at the motel they ran called the Dreamland Motel. It was four and a half miles away from Elliot's body shop. Had he ever seen the man matching the sketches with the rider truck? He replied that his mother rented room number 25 to that man on April 14th. McGowan recalls having three encounters with him. Once he struck a conversation up because the man's car had an, uh, an electric trunk open or something that struck the teenager as strange given how old the man's car was. The next encounter happened because his mother told him to move the truck he was now driving because he had parked in a permanent resident spot. That truck? A large yellow rider. The man politely moved it. The third time, McGowan noticed that the man was having trouble trying to close the front of the truck. When he retrieved the registration card for the agents, for the man in the yellow truck, for room number 25, investigators learned for the very first time the name Tim McVeigh. The address listed on the registration card was 3616 North Van Dyke in Decker, Michigan. The vehicle was listed as a Mercury with Arizona plates L2C-034. When people get arrested in America, their names are to be listed with the National Crime Information Center or the NCIC. Other law enforcement agencies have access to this database and can run the information checking an arrestee's criminal history. There was, in fact, one person arrested in America around that time with a name resembling the name listed on Dreamland's registration for Room 25. A Timothy James McVeigh was arrested by Oklahoma State Highway Patrol trooper named Charles Hanger about 70 miles north of Murrah on the morning of the bombing, April the 19th. Investigators learned that McVeigh was still in the Noble County Jail awaiting arraignment in a bail hearing on a weapons charge. On the morning of April 19th, Trooper Hanger heard about the explosion in Oklahoma City and headed there, going south on Interstate 35 from where he was. Before he got to Oklahoma City, however, dispatch told him to stand down and maintain his patrol. Some time passed when he noticed a 1977 four-door Mercury Marquis with a primer spot on the left rear quarter panel. There was no legal problem with the primer spot. It was the fact that there was no tag on the car that caught his attention. He turned around to pull the Marquis over. The driver complied, parking partially on the shoulder and partially on the grass. Trooper Hanger was on high alert, not because of the bombing, but because another trooper had been recently shot nearby. A white male exited the marquee as Hanger explained the reason why he pulled him over, no tag. The man replied that he had recently purchased the vehicle so he wouldn't have a bill of sale. When the man reached for his driver's license, the hypervigilant trooper noticed a bulge under his left arm. What is that? I have a gun, the man replied. 
Trooper Hanger retrieved the gun and threw it on the side of the roadway. When asked why he had the gun, the man said, I have a right to carry it for my protection. The man also had a knife and a clip. Trooper Hanger identified the driver by his license as a Timothy James McVeigh. He put McVeigh in his cruiser, retrieved the gun from the side of the road and the knife, and put them in the trunk for safekeeping. He noted that the gun was loaded with a particularly destructive bullet called a black talon round, designed to cause maximum damage to its target by expanding upon impact. The trooper called in McVeigh's name and identifying information to check for warrants and to give the serial number of the gun in case it had been reported stolen. Overhearing this, McVeigh volunteered the serial number of the gun from his memory. VM769, he said. Though he was off by one letter, VM, not VW, Trooper Hanger thought it strange that he committed the serial number to memory. When asked about the missing plate, McVeigh told the trooper he purchased the car in Junction City, Kansas from a Firestone dealer named Tom for 250 bucks. consented to the search of his car as well. Hanger told him that he was under arrest for unlawfully carrying the handgun and gave McVeigh the option to leave the car there on the side of the road or have it towed where it would be impounded and the contents would be cataloged. McVeigh opted to leave the car on the side of the road. After the 18 to 20 minute transport to the Noble County Jail, he escorted McVeigh inside to be booked in. McVeigh's clothes and personal property were collected and cataloged and stored in a bank bag. He was arrested, you know, 76 minutes after the bombing, wearing a T-shirt uh, that had an image of Abraham Lincoln and the Latin phrase, thus always to tyrants, which John Wilkes Booth had yelled after shooting Abraham Lincoln in the back of the head. Included in McVeigh's property was a set of earplugs. Officially, McVeigh was arrested for unlawfully carrying a weapon, transporting a loaded weapon in a motor vehicle and operating a motor vehicle without a license tag. These misdemeanor charges carried a potential sentence of up to a year in the county jail. McVeigh was booked in without incident, and Hanger eventually left for the day to go home. On his way home, as is his common practice, Hanger looked through his car to make sure there was nothing lying around that could be used as a weapon against him by another arrested person at some subsequent arrest. That's when he discovered and collected a crumpled up business card on the floor behind the seat McVeigh used that read, Paulson's Military Supply Store. On the back, quote, Dave, TNT, at $5 a stick, need more, 708-288-0128. Call after 1 May, see if I can get some more, end quote. In studying Charles Albright's case in Season 1, we identified the step-by-step process investigators walk that lead to a particular defendant as the homicide chain. By connecting the VIN number on the axle to a rider truck rental agreement for Robert Kling at Elliott's Body Shop in Junction City, to a neighborhood canvas that included the Dreamland Motel, which uncovered a man using a rider truck who rented room number 25 named Tim McVeigh, who was coincidentally arrested for a weapons charge, FBI agents had a consistent link from the bombing in Oklahoma City to the man in the Noble County Jail. But just a few days after the explosion, they knew very little about him. Investigators obtained a search warrant for the marquee still sitting on the grass and gravel of I-35, thus beginning the process to learn more about Timothy McVeigh. You know, just simply answering the question, who did this? And then uh, more importantly, or certainly equally important, was why. After the suspect is developed, the homicide chain becomes a working hypothesis that evidence gathered during the course of the investigation either proves or disproves. Links are either fortified or broken along the way. In Season 1, we studied the People of California versus Charles Tex Watson in the Tex and Charlie series. Tex and the rest of the Manson family told the world their motives by writing it in blood on the refrigerator, helter-skelter. Tying this unique or idiosyncratic motive to text became a prominent circumstance of guilt. Discerning and then tying the unique motive expressed in this crime that befell Murrah could likewise become a prominent circumstance of guilt against McVeigh. Motive is the force which instigates human conduct. It is the spring of all human action, including crime. Although some motives are hard to detect or pinpoint with certainty, an instigating reason for every crime always exists. Is it a good enough reason? Well, perhaps not to you or me, but that really isn't the test. Since the instigating force that springs a suspect into action is necessarily subjective and personal, the test is always whether the suspected motive provided a good enough reason to the person suspected of committing the crime. 
Once a motive is identified in the crime and once a suspect is developed, the quest for investigators becomes twofold. First, to discern the instant in time, if and when the apparent motive was born or awakened in the mind of the accused, we'll refer to this as the rule of inception, and second, to determine whether the mind and character of the suspect is capable of being sprung into action by that particular motive. We'll refer to this as the rule of imprinting. We'll begin by discerning the motive from the appearance of the crime scene in Oklahoma City. The use of a weapon of the size big enough to cause as much damage as was caused that April morning implies a certain amount of planning, skill, and knowledge. It also requires the collection, storage, and delivery of a number of unique and sizable components. Although impossible to say with precision, the plan must have existed for some sufficient amount of time to allow for the instrument to be created and dispatched. Second, the scale of the bomb and the damage it caused makes it unlikely that the murderous animosity was directed against a singular individual. Nothing about the crime seemed to reciprocate pecuniary gain either. Instead, the bomber appears to have desired mass destruction and indiscriminate casualty. This means the motive must have been driven by the desire to gratify some broader unlawful purpose, perhaps fame or revenge or redress. This ties into another lesson we learned back in Season 1, this one from Judd Ray and the Eyeball Killer, Victimology. The term refers to the need to gain a complete understanding of the identity and status of the victim in order to help investigators determine how and why the paths of the victim and suspect crossed. Murrah's formal title, the Alfred P. Murrah Federal Building, adorned the face of the building and confirmed it belonged to the United States. It housed a number of federal agencies, including the FBI and the ATF. Murrah appeared to be the lone target that morning, the victim of one mid-range velocity device whose bite-marked wound and corresponding dispersion pattern indicated that the blast was directed into the building, and since the perpetrator apparently directed his murderous intent at the building itself, Murrah's wound is most consistent with the suspect's desire for revenge or redress against what the building represented to the suspect himself. Now that the motive was potentially identified from the appearance of the crime scene and Timothy James McVeigh, the man in the Noble County Jail, was tied with some force to the rider truck axle that landed 575 feet away from Murrah's bite mark, investigators had to answer two questions, the second building on the first. Number one, did he possess a motive against Murrah and what it stood for or represented, what we've referred to as the rule of inception? And number two, was he the type of person that could have actually committed the crime of dispatching a weapon of mass destruction in an American city, indiscriminately killing numerous people, what we call the rule of imprinting? In order to uncover these answers, investigators started with the man himself. Who was he? Where did he come from? Where was he going? And what did he have with him when he was arrested? And we'll start with where he came from. But I think that if you t if you change a few things, a few events in Tim's life, he would he would be a, a decorated military person today. He said I was really out of shape, and but I I wanted to be in the special forces, so I went. I accepted it. I went and I washed out in three days. because the military was all he had. The man Trooper Hanger pulled over on I-35 on April 19, 1995 at 10.20 a.m. was born on April 23, 1968 in Lockport, New York, the son of William and Mildred McVeigh. Timothy has a younger sister by six years named Jennifer and another sister named Patricia, two years his senior. Tim's dad, William Bill McVeigh, had been an auto worker since 1963. His mother, Mickey, worked most frequently as a travel agent. McVeigh grew up in upstate New York. He started the first grade in September of 74 in Lockport, a small town just outside of Buffalo, continued all of his schooling there. During his senior year, he got a, an honor pass award given to students who exhibited above-average academic performance and initiative. 
He graduated from Star Point High School in June of 1986, and although he was awarded a small Regent scholarship to a state university in New York, he never did go to college. He first started working at Burger King in the fall of 86, a job he held until the spring of 87. He worked as an armored car driver for Burke Security in Buffalo until he joined the United States Army in May of 1988. His permanent station became Fort Riley, Kansas. He became a gunner for a Bradley fighting vehicle repeatedly throughout his Army service, achieving a top gun ranking. In fact, he ranked first among 93 other Bradley gunners. He achieved extraordinary advancement in the enlisted ranks from a private E-1 to a Sergeant E-5 in less than three years. When Operation Desert Shield became Operation Desert Storm, he served in the Kuwait-Iraq operations. He was literally on the front lines and made one of the very first invasions into enemy area. During this service in the military, he earned one of our nation's highest awards, the Bronze Star, because, quote, his flawless devotion to duty truly exemplified the finest traditions of the military service. He also earned the Army Commendation Medal for, quote, meritorious achievement with valor during Operation Desert Storm while assigned as an infantryman to the Team Alpha Task Force on February 25th of 1991 in southern Iraq. He, quote, inspired all members of his squad and platoon by destroying an enemy machine gun placement, killing two Iraqi soldiers and forcing the surrender of 30 other enemy soldiers in dug-in positions, end quote. His unit was chosen to be the inner perimeter guard at the site where General Norman Schwarzkopf and his opposite number in the Iraqi army arranged the terms of the armistice that ended the war. And after the war, McVeigh returned to the United States intent on joining into the special forces. And although he'd been given the opportunity to postpone trying out for the special forces, he went for it. The problem was he had lost a considerable amount of weight while he was in the desert and he wasn't physically fit enough to succeed. He dropped out on the second day. He went back to Fort Riley, stayed in the service, and then eventually got out in 1992. It was a regretfully disappointing end to his once promising Army career. Around this time, two events pitting the United States government against its own citizens unfolded. Both significantly shaped McVeigh's worldview. The first happened in August of 1992 in an Idaho town 40 miles away from the Canadian border called Ruby Ridge. United States federal marshals were engaged in an 11-day standoff with a former United States Army engineer named Randy Weaver. It all began because Weaver was under indictments and awaiting trial for illegally purchasing two sawed-off shotguns from undercover agents. The trial date was moved and a letter was sent to him alerting him of the new trial date. However, the new date, as listed in the notification, was incorrect. Everybody agrees on that. But when he missed a court date, a warrant was issued for his arrest and agents were dispatched to serve the warrant. And on August the 22nd, an FBI sniper fired two shots at Weaver, thinking Weaver was going to shoot an FBI helicopter. The first hit Weaver in the arm and the second hit Weaver's wife in her face, killing her. Weaver surrendered and was charged with a host of crimes, including murder. The fallout from the ordeal was immense, viewed by many, like McVeigh, as a deadly tyrannical exercise of power by the United States government against its own citizens. A few months later, FBI agents obtained a search warrant for the Branch Davidian compound, 13 miles outside of Waco, Texas. The group was suspected of stockpiling weapons illegally. When agents went to serve the warrant, a gunfight ensued, and several agents and Branch Davidians were killed in the warrant remained unexecuted. A 51-day standoff followed. On April the 19th of 1993, the FBI initiated the execution of the warrant with tear gas and stormed the compound. Fires broke out, igniting the entire structure. In all, 76 Branch Davidians were killed that day, including their leader, David Koresh. Michelle Rauch was a journalism student from Southern Methodist University in Dallas. During the standoff, she actually traveled to Mount Carmel just outside of Waco, looking for a story on the compound. By pure happenstance, she decided to interview a man sitting on the hood of his car. He was selling bumper stickers, some of which read, Politicians love gun control, and a man with a gun is a citizen, a man without a gun is a subject. It was Tim McVeigh, and he agreed to be interviewed. Quote, The government is afraid of the guns people have because they have to have control of the people at all times. Once you take away the guns, you can do anything to the people. 
I believe we are slowly turning into a socialist government. It is continually growing bigger and more powerful, and the people need to prepare to defend themselves against government control. So said Timothy McVeigh back in 1993. McVeigh concluded that the federal government unjustifiably killed its own people in Waco and in Ruby Ridge and was covering it up. Both were strong indications, if not direct proof, of an oppressive, anti-democratic government. McVeigh also believed the United Nations were trying to form a one-world government. In order to accomplish this, they had to disarm the American people. Quote, Waco could be the start of the government coming house to house to retrieve the weapons from citizens. End quote. He called this the New World Order, an elite group within the United Nations looking to form a single government to control the world. Americans didn't see what was happening around them. McVeigh's hunger for literature and information of this sort was insatiable. He had a subscription to a magazine called The Patriot Report, a media outlet that talked a lot about this New World Order and the perceived takeover of America by the United Nations. He read the Spotlight News magazine put out by Liberty Lobby, quote, all the news the mainstream media won't print, end quote. It is, according to its founder, William Sweet, a, quote, populist conservative magazine that is anti-NAFTA treaties, anti-abortion, pro-gun, but not anti-government. McVeigh earned money during this time by buying and selling and trading guns, ammunition, and other gear at gun shows all across the country. When he came home to upstate New York to visit his sister Jennifer in November of 94, he was totally immersed and preoccupied with his anti-government sentiment. He brought a video with him to share with her called Day 51. He told her the ATF and the FBI was responsible and felt that someone should be held accountable for what they did. He also used her word processor to type some letters, some of which were later recovered by the FBI. If you, if you had sort of um, a route to the explosion of the vo volcano, you could almost trace it in the letters that McVeigh was writing the year and a half before the bombing. You know, his increased anger towards uh, our federal government is, is uh, you know, he, his dedication to the belief that someone had to take a, a violent act against the country. And so he was putting that in his writings. One letter in particular was addressed to the American Legion and read like this. We members of the citizens' militia do not bear our arms to overthrow the Constitution, but to overthrow those who pervert the Constitution, if and when they once again draw first blood. The ATF are a fascist federal group, infamous for depriving Americans of their liberties, as well as other constitutionally guaranteed inalienable rights, such as one's right to self-defense. Citizens' militias will hopefully ensure that violations of the Constitution by these power-hungry stormtroopers of the federal government will not succeed again. After all, who else would come to the rescue of those innocent women and children at Waco? One last question that every American should ask themselves. Did not the British also keep track of the locations of munitions stored by the colonists, just as the ATF admitted doing? Why? Does anyone even study history anymore? End quote. Another letter he wrote on his sister's word processor was titled ATF-Read, and reads as follows. Quote, ATF, all you tyrannical bastards will swing in the wind one day for your treasonous actions against the Constitution and the United States. William Epright works for the evidence response team for the FBI. His task was to search and collect any evidence from McVeigh's Mercury Marquis. The car was towed from the side of I-35 and taken in for processing. Inside, Epright found a cardboard sign with a note handwritten in large letters, quote, Not abandoned. Please do not tow. Will move by April 23. Needs battery and cable, end quote. He also found an envelope in the car which contained writings on papers and articles, copies of books and pamphlets. Handwritten on the outside of that envelope, Obey the Constitution of the United States and we won't shoot you, end quote. On another clipping, there is a reference to a key incident during the American Revolutionary Period in Lexington, Massachusetts. The British sought to disarm the citizens. The citizens fought back. Quote, they stood and fought on principle for their rights and for their liberty. And once that historic day-long battle began, farmers and merchants from miles around came to join the fight against the government. The date of this historic fight? April 19th. 1775. Quote, How many of us thought about the brave stand at Lexington, the armed confrontation which started the war for independence and resulted in the creation of our beloved United States of America? 
Today, however, most people will not become concerned enough about their freedom to shut off their televisions and look out their doors until something affects them personally and directly. Another handwritten note from the Mercury. Quote, The recent 51-day siege and massacre of nearly 100 men, women, and children in Waco, Texas, was a crime of the greatest magnitude. It was a cruel, sadistic, brutal crime. It was a crime which violated nearly every article of the Bill of Rights and every civil right of the rebellious religious group which lived at that facility. It resembled the burning and obliteration of Christian cities and the annihilation of their inhabitants by Mughal hordes in earlier centuries. There is no longer any doubt the U.S. government has declared open warfare on the American people. The enemies of freedom, who are the enemies of America, must be made to know that we will not only resist their evil agenda, their imposed decadence, and their oppression, but we will physically fight. They must know that we will not shrink from spilling their blood. The great Thomas Jefferson, author of the Declaration of Independence and the third president of the United States, set the example for patriots when he said, quote, The tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. It is its natural manure. Finally, among the papers in McVeigh's Mercury were copies of pages 61 and 62 of Andrew McDonald's book, The Turner Diaries. A passage from the book had been highlighted, quote, But the real value of our attacks today lies in the psychological impact, not in the immediate casualties. More important, though, is what we taught the politicians and bureaucrats. They learned this afternoon that not one of them is beyond our reach. They can huddle behind barbed wire and tanks in the city, or they can hide behind concrete walls and alarm systems at their country estates. But we will find them, and we will kill them. Investigators eventually discovered McVeigh's keen fascination with the Turner Diaries. He discovered the book in the Army, sold copies on the gun show circuit, and shared copies with his sister Jennifer, personal friends Kyle Krauss, David Darlack, and Kevin Nicholas, and a fellow soldier named Michael Fortier. McVeigh ultimately believed that there could be another civil war in America if the government continued to take away guns and strong-arm the public. The revolution in real life would resemble the revolution in the Turner Diaries. There, the new civil war was led by a group who had had enough of the government. They wanted to strike back against it and at the people who made the laws that infringed upon their rights. They decided they were going to blow up the White House, and a federal building. how they decide to do that in the book? A truck made of ammonium nitrate, nitromethane, and anhydrous hydrazine. The United States of America versus Timothy James McVeigh The trial styled the United States of America versus Timothy James McVeigh was held in Denver, Colorado, Judge Richard Mage presiding the largest and deadliest act of domestic terrorism in the United States, beget the largest investigation in the history of the United States, second only to the September 11th attacks. 28,000 interviews were conducted, tons, literally tons of evidence were collected and analyzed. 13 different lawyers questioned 171 witnesses who took the stand, some more than once. Opening statements lasted one day. If convicted as charged, Timothy McVeigh faced the death penalty that the government was very concerned about whether they could convict Timothy McVeigh because it was a circumstantial case. The truth is uh, we had no on the ground ID of anybody uh, known Tim McVeigh at that time. Circumstantially, there was nothing that tied him to the building or the detonation of that bomb. Next time, we begin our review of the trial itself and learn how prosecutors confronted the biggest problem in their case. We'll meet with a witness who claimed McVeigh showed her how he was going to build the bomb using Campbell soup cans, how he planned on funding the mission, and what McVeigh was hiding in some Christmas packages. The script for the show and an interactive trial visualization report is available on amurderousdesign.com. Take a look and let me know if you have any questions. Thanks again to Prosecutor Larry Mackey, Stephen Jones, and Mr. Tritico for Mr. McVeigh for sharing their thoughts with us along the way. I'm Brandon Birmingham. This is Timothy James McVeigh versus the USA on a murderous design. Mm-hmm.